I'm a 22-year resident of Winter Park. I came to um, UCF to start my engineering degree in 1980. About six months after I arrived, the Winter Park sinkhole opened up, and that was the first time I toured Winter Park. We ate on the uh, Park Avenue at Cafe du France. Uh, we fell in love with the place, and like the Porsches in the sinkholes, I was consumed by Winter Park. <laughs> so I'm the fifth of 10 children, and I changed a lot of diapers as a child. I changed my first one at four. Uh, my mother was quite busy, as you can imagine, so I had to help raise my um, five younger siblings. We're a very close family. I have no children of my own, but um, I have 20 lovely nieces and nephews, and to them, I'm Uncle Todd, the guy that gives them money and uh, candy if, if they're small enough and advice too. So recently, um, two of my nieces who are very close in age uh, started University of Wisconsin. One of them wanted to be a dancer and I said, Lauren, you can be a dancer, but you have to have a minor. You'll have student loans to pay back. <laughs> so with that, um, after you graduate from engineering school, um, Winter Park's a, a little pricey place to buy a home, so it took me a little while, but in 1997, I bought my home on Lake Bell. We were in Orange County at the time, not uh, yet annexed, although we had a Winter Park address. Um, about a year and a half after I moved there, the ecology of Lake Bell crashed very suddenly. We had huge floating mats of algae, the mosquito. Um, I knew something was seriously wrong, so I went to Orange County Environmental Protection Division they said, we have no money or uh, manpower to help. You have to do it yourself. So I enlisted 12 of my neighbors. And for a year, on the odd weekend, we'd go out and pick aquatic plants at various lakes in the Orlando wetlands and restored almost a mile of shoreline of Lake Bell. And we learned in a very personal way that caring for the environment was critical to our health our quality of life, and our property values. And the most important thing that came out of this, because of this common cause, our neighborhood became a community. And I know how that works, and that's how I feel about Winter Park. It's a community, not a commodity. Thank you. Yes, good afternoon. I'm Pete Weldon. I'm your incumbent city commissioner. Uh, my commitment to our city began in 1989 when Fran and I moved here uh, and shortly thereafter had children and we raised our children here. They were born at, at Winter Park Memorial Hospital. Uh, Fran has served as our neighborhood watch coordinator for 25 years. And I got involved in the city myself as did Todd in his community. Uh, almost 12 years ago. Um, I, I appreciate the environmental work that Todd has done. I have also, I think, represented the city well as a concerned citizen. I volunteered for the Code Enforcement Board beginning in 2008. I then served on the Tree Preservation Board. Three years later, I served on the Planning and Zoning Board. And three years ago, you all elected me as your city commissioner. And I hope you'll do the same on March 12th. Uh, I have a master's degree in business from Duke University. I had a career with Johnson & Johnson, the pharmaceutical and healthcare company, in which uh, I uh, started a surgical laser business and became the vice president and CFO of that operation when I was 31 years old. It was a fantastic experience. As a result of that experience, I sought out the job as a president and CEO of a venture-backed startup and was recruited uh, to come down here in 1989 as a result of that. A few years later, I pursued a chartered financial analyst designation and became an investment advisor, and I have been building value my entire career. I uh, have built value for myself, my family, my employees, my customers, my clients, and I have been very satisfied in terms of my efforts to try to build value for Winter Park. Um, I have proven my commitment to protecting the oasis called Winter Park. Um, I've proven that I get results that matter to you. 
Um, I apply my experience to look deeply into issues and to understand and improve our foundation in Winter Park and our financial strength. <laughs> okay. Got it? That's okay. Can I have a couple more seconds for that? Okay, thanks. Okay, I'll, uh, uh, I'll close with, 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 with just touching on some of the results that I've gotten for us in Winter Park. Um, I, I moved forward and voted for a power agreement that is going to, to deliver 7% of our power beginning 2021 through large-scale solar fields. It makes economic sense and environmental sense. I'm embracing and supporting our new vision as the City of Arts and Culture uh, there are a tremendous amount of, of uh, improvements we've made in the city that I think you've seen from the complete redo of the hard courts at Azalea Lane Tennis Center to the work that's been done on the golf course and in the golf course parking lot. And I'll look forward to speaking to more of these as the debate proceeds. Thanks. We're going to start with the, uh, the questions. Use the mic, please. Use the mic. We'll start with the questions now. Todd, what is your philosophy with regard to the property rights of business owners, developers, and homeowners versus community aesthetics and design standards? Well, that's a good question, Bob, thank you. Um, the intro was short, but I also have a general contractor's license in addition to being an aerospace and mechanical engineer. I run two Winter Park-based businesses as well. So my development partner, we've developed properties in Orange and Marion County, and our property rights, we consider this. When we bought a property, it was zoned a certain way, and we developed according to those zoning regulations. We never asked for a variance, up zoning, um, any kind of special treatment. We never lobbied a legislator or um, any city official to get special favors. Um, and when we were done with projects, they were always an improvement to the neighborhood. The neighbors were always happy with what we did. And in a couple of cases, because of our initial investment in that community, other people started um, escalating the, the quality of their homes and their landscaping. And that's what I believe property rights are. I don't believe in up zoning and giving away um, entitlements to developers for free. Certain uh, developers are taking advantage of that here in Winter Park. Um, most developers do follow the rules, and um, we do have some good developers that make quality products, but um, we do have some challenges along those lines. Thank you. Yeah, so with regard to the balance of, 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 of property rights and the design and aesthetics of Winter Park, uh, I, uh, uh, three years ago, uh, I strongly defended uh, a tree policy that I helped lead the way on that restored rights to property owners while it increased the canopy on private property. Uh, years ago, uh, before I got involved, we were fining our homeowners thousands of dollars to remove a tree where they wanted to put a swimming pool or an addition. I worked through the property rights aesthetics issue very carefully and refined our policy so that it was not fining people to remove a tree. They still had to replace it, but there were no fines but also newly required dead, dying, and diseased trees to be replanted at the owner's expense so that we got more canopy than we had under the old policy without finding them. Uh, I have been deeply involved in the tree uh, management in Winter Park. Uh, years ago, I got involved in changing our focus from tree preservation to forestry management of our street trees. We have, uh, over the past several years, we have invested about $2 million a year in, in, in culling dangerous and dying trees in our rights of way and replacing them with new trees of a hardier species, matching up where we're planting the trees as we proceed with the electric undergrounding program so that 20 years from now, 
those trees will be healthy and full canopy and there will be no wires there. That's part of the vision that I've had for the aesthetics of Winter Park neighborhoods for years and I've worked hard to implement it. Mr. Weldon, what do you see as the best use of land in the Orange, Orange Avenue corridor between Denning Drive and 1792 for the developers of the city and, and the city? Uh, I have no particular bias towards any particular redevelopment plan. If uh, nobody wants to do it, I, I'm happy to leave the, the codes as they are. However, I think we've all seen the value that Hannibal Square has brought to Winter Park over the past 20 years and how it complements the mixed-use context on Park Avenue. I've been trying to lead a discussion as to whether or not we want to go down that path, and I don't believe Mr. Weaver does, even though he affirms that he supports that, that level of mixed-use context. Uh, so I am very open to discussing those things. I have uh, uh, a hope, frankly, that is that we have designed a downtown around Central Park. We have designed Hannibal Square around green space. If we can leverage that green space on Orange Avenue to build the same type of community environment, I think it's worth pursuing, and I hope people don't, uh, uh, don't dismiss the opportunity we have to build value in that manner without imposing high density high apartments and all that kind of stuff on Winter Park. Let's just keep it consistent with the character of Winter Park that we already know and love. Thank you. My opponent talked about mixed use developments and we do have several very nice examples of that in the area of Park Avenue, Winter Park Village, and uh, Hannibal Square. Um, all those have those attributes that we love about Winter Park. Um, full tree canopies, brick streets, um, quaint shops and neighborhoods, but we also see mixed use in Maitland right now. So these new unknown mixed use standards that my opponent is talking about, um, they could come in any form. And the reason those three developments here work so well and not in Maitland, the ones on Maitland are on a major thoroughfare with fast traffic all the shops have not been rented. Well, I should say about 80% of them, and that's an eight-year-old development. Um, it's much too close to the street. People do not feel safe. Um, I don't feel that's appropriate for Winter Park, and I would not support that type of um, development on Orange Avenue. I believe I got a rebuttal. Yes, you have a rebuttal. Um, you know, just to note that I think Mr. Weaver and I actually agree on this, and uh, he's been trying to make it a controversy. I think it's an opportunity. Uh, uh, and I'm happy to work with, with, with Todd and anybody else in our community who is concerned about the possibilities. Mr. Weaver on Friday said residents were terrified of the possibilities. Well, I don't think it's the role of a leader to terrify the community. I think it's the role of a leader to lead. And I'm happy to discuss and wish that we can discuss the breadth of potential for a compatible mixed-use context that mirrors what we know. That's all. Thank you. Mr. Weaver, what steps have you advocated for or will you take to address traffic congestion in Winter Park? Good question. Um, it's probably the number one thing that I've talked to supporters and constituents or future constituents about is traffic. So I'm on the League of Women Voters Transportation Committee and I meet often with uh, local, county, and state officials as well as staff and uh, politicians come and go so it's important for me to meet staff because they're long-term uh, doers of these things. So I'm a big proponent of alternate transportation. I've been a, a SunRail fan for a long time. I'm working with um, City of Orlando and other partner counties to make a link to the airport. Right now you can take a Lynx bus but the schedules, uh, the schedule coordination is awkward. But the ultimate thing is to try to make sure we don't add population and density 
before we figure out what to do with our roads. Um, doing development beforehand and adding cars to the road is not a solution, it's the problem. So we can develop electric bicycles, um, bike paths. We have a good start with um, Denning and uh, the Katy Way Trail. Um, there are all kinds of alternate transportation things that we can come up with, but it's not a local issue. We have to work with regional and state officials and staff to make that happen. Uh, yes, again, I think Mr. Weaver and I agree for the most part on the realistic ways that we can address traffic. I'm as frustrated as you are and everybody else in Winter Park. We have 40,000 cars a day going across Aloma and, uh, and Lakemont. We have 40,000 cars a day going across 1792 and, and Fairbanks. And we have 40,000 cars a day crossing Lee Road. Uh, and 1792. Um, the vast majority of that traffic is brought to us courtesy of the growth in Orange County, not the growth in Winter Park. And uh, it has been my priority uh, for the past three years to do strategic changes that will limit our population growth. And to that end, I led the effort and I moved on the commission to remove high density apartment zonings from our comprehensive plan. That is a very significant change. I don't think any community, I haven't heard of any community who has been able to get that accomplished. I led the charge run and I got a 5-0 vote and no developer. Now, this doesn't apply to you because you have R4 zoning and you're gonna develop under your zoning, but nobody can ask for R4 zoning anymore in Winter Park without proposing a change to the comprehensive plan, which adds significantly <coughs> to the burden of making that change. And I think it's a great protection for our community to keep the scale and the population intact while we create value uh, that we all love in living here. Thank you. Mr. Weldon, what have you done or would you do to address the parking shortage on Park Avenue, including handicapped parking? Uh, the City Commission has considered and acted on a number of initiatives with regard to downtown parking in the past three years. Most recently, uh, we agreed to make a change in the parking code downtown that, uh, uh, that, that does away with the opportunity for restaurants to not require their own parking. Uh, back in 1972 or so, all, when the first parking codes were written, uh, all of the properties on Park Avenue, and I believe within 140 feet of Park Avenue, were grandfathered in so that they didn't have to provide their own parking. And as a result, these restaurants that have come, which I think many of us enjoy, have not had their own parking requirements. Well, beginning effective, of, you know, maybe two months ago, now any new restaurant has to provide parking to code, which is approximately I think one space per 50 square feet or something of seating area. Uh, and that's a significant change that will control the demand for parking as new restaurants may want to come here. Uh, I think handicapped parking, I'd have to check with our code officers on that, but I believe we have a legal requirement to provide a specific percentage of handicapped parking. And uh, I, I believe that uh, uh, we should do that uh, and meet the rules, and I'll check on that, but I believe that we already do meet the requirements for handicap parking uh, as a percentage of uh, our total spaces. But I'll check on it. Mr. Weaver? So we do have some handicap parking along the Central Park sidewalk, but unfortunately it's a brick street, so getting wheelchairs and walkers and things like that across to the shops and the restaurant is a challenge right now, and that's an easy solution with smoother crosswalks um, very close to um, those parking spaces. Um, I supported some of the parking changes that we've made, especially the um, retail <coughs> restaurant without parking. Um, I did not support the fee in lieu of parking for large office buildings like um, some property owners want downtown. Um, I do think there are some challenges on the ADA ramps at certain intersections. I know of one on Morse, and again, those are easy fixes, but our public works department is pretty much overloaded with other product or projects. Uh, the new Denning um, 
Complete Street from uh, Canton to Webster is keeping a lot of them busy right now. So all these things are on a list to do, and uh, we need funding, we need uh, manpower, and um, a committee probably of people like you to tell us what you need. And that's what I'm going to bring to the commission is a voice for you. I will listen and I will collaborate with my fellow commissioners and the city staff. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Weaver, what do you think should be done with the current library site? <laughs> you just had to ask, didn't you, Bob? <laughs> well, uh, I was a proponent of, of a couple of the other um, makeovers of the old library site originally, but when the uh, referendum came up where we were going to get a, a much larger library, I, I fully support the lifelong learning mission of the library, so I actually voted for it. Um, it was a very close vote, 5,200 citizens voted no, 5,400 voted yes, and it's been controversial to say the least. So right now we're in a position where we're cutting down at least 63 trees because city management and the commission, unfortunately, um, took the parking structure out of the original bond agreement with the citizens. Um, we're paving seven or eight percent more of the city park, one of our bigger parks. City staff on the current status of the library project. And uh, months ago, uh, the city manager was directed by the city commission to bring the project in to the expectation level of the library and the event center management at the budget that the voters approved. I was satisfied after meeting with them and reviewing all of their work to date and their cost estimates and the questions remaining with regard to their cost estimates that we will, in fact, bring that project as expected in within the budget that the voters approved. For Mr. Weaver to claim that that is not true uh, is uh, not responsible. Uh, Mr. Weaver is welcome to go see the same documents and reach his own conclusion, but he's not, uh, he's not free, in my view, to offer public opinions as a candidate that are not justified by the facts. Uh, I look forward to the Canopy Project. It's gonna be a tremendous asset for our city. I have some ideas about uh, how to work with the old library property, but I'm going to be cut off in a minute. To, uh, I'll be happy to discuss those after the debate is over. Thanks a lot. Bob, may I have a rebuttal? Yes. So I'm going to hand Mr. Weldon the current budget, <coughs> the current costs, and the total at the bottom is $40.5 million for the Canopy Project right now, and that's not including some of the soft costs. So for Mr. Weldon to say that this project is on budget is just disingenuous. I'm a builder, I know how things work. I'm an engineer, I know how budgets work. This is not going to come within budget without some chicanery with accounting. And I am not a proponent of using CRA funds to gold plate or um, make this thing come in. It was a $30 million project, period. Who's going to skip the next one? Um, Pete, what is your philosophy on expanding walking and bike trails in the city, and how do, you, how do we make them safer? Uh, the opportunity to bring uh, the Canopy Project to $40 million is based entirely on amenities that the lead architect is recommending to the city. No one has approved that spending. No one has approved those amenities. The base project promised to the voters is able to be delivered according to city staff and all of the professionals at the budget that the citizens approved. With regard to uh, uh, safe transportation, the great example of what's possible is what we're doing on Denny Drive, where we have a, a 10 or 11 foot wide path. Uh, we call it a multi-use path because it's safe for both, both cyclists and pedestrians. That's so gonna go all the way from Mead Garden up to the Whole Foods area. And that is separated from the roadway by a two or four, a, 
a two to four foot landscape buffer that provides that sense of security that we all want when we're, when we're walking uh, uh, along a public road. Uh, that kind of boulevarding is uh, much in my thoughts as we look at other potential streets in Winter Park where that kind of concept can be put into place. And I'm already looking at uh, the opportunities along Lakemont to do the same thing without restricting traffic uh, and other places within Winter Park where, where we can do that. And I'm a big supporter of that. That's weird. Um, I like the Denning makeover. Um, unfortunately, it's not complete yet. The intersection at Fairbanks is still a problem. And I'm a proponent of um, doing some further work. Some of the uh, medians aren't designed quite right for people coming off turning left. Um, there's not enough room to sit in the median to wait for oncoming traffic. So there are some challenges there, but I agree that uh, that's the wave of the future. Some of your um, children or grandchildren probably aren't even buying cars these days and we need to get ready for that and having bike paths and alternate uh, transportation worked out is um, a big challenge that I'll accept gladly on the commission. I have a good background for it. Thank you. Mr. Weaver, what actions have you taken or would you support to improve the natural environment of Winter Park? Well, I served six years on our lakes and Waterways Advisory Board the last two years as chairman, and before that I was on the Orange County Lakes Advisory Board for four years. Um, I studied, my uh, master's work was in biochemistry and microbiology at University of Florida, so I have the science background. Um, stormwater management um, has become an issue because of um, lot coverages, larger homes uh, with bigger footprints, larger office buildings, and we're actually using our lakes for stormwater management, which isn't really the right thing to do. We also have these um, old uh, 1960s drain wells that uh, when we have extreme events, 100-year storms, which we've had three of in the last 15 years, um, they actually drain excess water down into our drinking water aquifer. We have quite a few of these around Central Florida, and, and Winter Park has uh, their share of them. Uh, they're concrete pipes, they're decaying, uh, they could collapse and drain a lake. Um, they're troublesome and we need to work something better than that out to keep the lake quality and water quality as we like it. I'm, re I'm responding to that question now? Yes. <coughs> could you please repeat the question again? Sure. What actions, what actions have you taken or would you support to improve the natural environment in Winter Park? Right, uh, I've, I've already touched on uh, my commitment to our canopy and to the street trees and the entire management of that over the past 10 years has been uh, uh, a very important project for me to tie that together with our electric undergrounding to bring every neighborhood uh, the, the type of healthy, unimpeded tree canopy that we enjoy now, for example, next to the golf course. The other uh, significant thing that I've done is uh, very aggressively supported and moved forward and beat on the city manager to get us control of 55 acres of new green space on the north side of Howell Branch Road. Uh, that acquisition is complete. We have a $2 million grant that I've been working with the city manager and staff on trying to get the improvements to that, to that area that will be of value to our residents. It, it's gonna connect the, the uh, Howell Creek from Lake Maitland to Lake Wampy up to the north. And, and we now control that, that section and it will be available uh, in the near future for things like kayaking and canoeing We'll, you know, we'll put trails in there and other things. Uh, uh, the, the other aspect of the aesthetics of Winter Park, to me, rests with arts and culture. I've become, well, I have been a music lover all my life, and I've embraced the arts and culture uh, vision for Winter Park, and a lot of the venues we have, ranging from the Polisec, and I think I've been cut off, but you, you get the point. 
Thank you. Mr. Weldon, Winter Park is no longer able to properly dispose of recyclable waste overseas. Why continue recycling pickup in the city? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the premise. It may be valid, but you're saying overseas? Yes. Uh, I realize there's a lot of uh, intermediaries between the shipment of the waste overseas, right. and what we're saying is that has been cut off. So we've found a number of facilities around the uh, right. country. I got it. Right. Stop. Yeah, yeah, I can do it. Uh, yes, the ability of the city to sell its recycling has been dramatically reduced, and I believe we might actually be paying now to 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 place the recycling. Uh, to a third party vendor. Uh, to me, it's uh, a, a social expectation that we will uh, try to recycle as much as we can of everything we consume. Uh, and I have no problem paying for recycling if in fact it's, it is being recycled and that it's not ending up in a landfill, right? Uh, otherwise we'd be wasting our time as, as, as well as our conscience wouldn't be uh, uh, would, would not be properly addressed, I guess is the way to put that. So uh, I'm a supporter of recycling regardless of the circumstances so long as uh, the materials that we're paying for recycling are actually recycling and if we have to pay for it, I think it'll end up in our bill and I would expect the majority of Winter Park property owners and residents to support that, I believe. Well, we have a landfill that has 40 years of life left and um, that's not very long so if we can't recycle um, then it goes in the landfill so there are um, companies technology companies uh, one that i'm very excited about and i'm probably going to buy their stock if they go public um, they're recycling glass to make aggregate for asphalt instead of using stone um, that's one use for glass. Uh, we use way too much plastic, in my opinion. Uh, the state of California and uh, some of the larger um, cities up in the Northeast have uh, banned certain types of plastic food containers and um, the plastic shopping bags. And I'm a proponent of that. A lot of it ends up in the ocean, but we just don't have the volume uh, left in our landfill uh, to keep doing this, so I, I'd like to see some, um, you know, reusable grocery bags. I have some in my car. I always forget them when I go in to buy it, so I ended up loading them from the car right into the car. But um, yeah, there are solutions out there, but um, we have to be mindful. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. Are you in favor of accelerating the undergrounding of? power lines, and if yes, how would you recommend the city pay for it? Well, let me start off by saying there were three large areas that were annexed in 2004, the Lee Road Corridor, a large section on the east side of town, and then um, some neighborhoods north of Corrine. Fifteen years later, and tens of millions of dollars in tax revenue generated from those properties into the city, all those properties are still on septic tanks. They're still paying commercial power companies. Um, people in those neighborhoods feel like they're not really part of the city. So I'm thrilled that we're undergrounding um, Mr. Weldon's neighborhood. I think it's already done. But um, imagine that you live in one of these outlying neighborhoods and you're not even on the undergrounding plan. I'm a big proponent of it. it um, you know, where I live, when we have storms, it's not unusual for our power to be out for a week when Mr. Weldon's is out for two days tops. So, I, you know, when Mr. Weldon was at the debate with um, our fine commissioner in 2016, one of his things that he ran on was that all city residents should have the same services, and it just hasn't happened. Um, the, um, the undergrounding of our electric is only available to us on the distribution systems that the city owns and controls. The city owns and controls the distribution system that was owned by Progress Energy, now Duke, 
that was uh, in place at the city limits when the city purchased the system. Since that, since that purchase, the annexations that Mr. Weaver is referring to are not part of the original agreement to purchase the electric distribution system. So all the city can do is try to purchase the rest of the distribution system, which is not economically viable. Uh, and Duke has no legal obligation to sell it to us. The other thing I'd say about sewers is that uh, uh, what Mr. Weaver is suggesting with regard to sewer is he wants you to pay for his sewer. Well, everyone who has a property in Winter Park paid for their sewer, either in the, in the value of their home or when they converted from septic. And I think uh, there, there are procedures in place if, if Mr. Weaver and his neighbors want sewer service, they can petition the city, and I think it's a 66.6% .6 threshold, and the city will, will, will provide the sewers and the neighborhood will agree to pay for it in their tax bill over a number of years, and that's available to them if he wants it. Thanks. Mr. Weaver, you can rebut. Well, I can assure you, I've been petitioning the city for the last three years during Mr. Weldon's tenure, and the city put up a bond of $50 million to make sure his undergrounding was done, and those city uh, lines were put in, and the power equipment was bought from Progress back then. That same type of bond should be available for these outlying properties. And now when we're talking about sewer, this is one of my favorite things. So I live off of Lee Road, and there are three developers at the, at the corner of Lee Road and 1792 that all got city services instantly as soon as they developed their properties, and we're still waiting. Thank you. Mr. Weldon, do you support the administration's goal to accumulate 3% of annual recurring costs? Um, I made a recommendation that we lower that threshold to 25%, and I'm proud to say that as of the end of this fiscal year, we should be at that number. Uh, uh, you know, one of the things I'm most proud of in my service to the city is that we have invested a great deal in the amenities and the quality and character of our city over the past several years. At the same time, we have been able to increase our unrestricted cash reserves from $8 million to an expected $14 million as of the end of this year. Uh, that'll be 25% of this year's operating expenses. Uh, I think that's probably sufficient. Uh, if there are no compelling investments or requirements of the city uh, to spend more money, uh, uh, I would agree, I think, to allow it to go to 30% uh, because it provides all of us not only with the protection of being able to respond to hurricanes instantly, but also creates opportunities for us to have the cash available when something like land comes up for sale that's strategically important for the city, that we can then just purchase it. Uh, and so financial strength goes along with investing in the city at the same time, and I think I've helped deliver that kind of positive result. Could you repeat the question, Bob? <laughs> yeah, what actions have you taken or would you support to, I'm sorry, that's the wrong question. Ray, help me out. Do you support the administration's goal of accumulating 3% of annual recurring costs? I do, and it has to be at a, a reasonable rate, too, without starving other budgets. Um, we're currently having an issue with um, trained staff employees, some fairly highly higher level employees leaving for less affluent cities around here for, for employment. Um, that's because the budget is set up such that uh, we're just not paying some of our police officers adequately. Uh, we lost two of our finest um, long-term lakes workers to Castleberry recently, and it's all about pay. 
So um, we can't starve budgets. It has to be a better balance than what we're seeing right now. But yes, I do support having those reserves because it takes a long time to get FEMA money back when we have repairs for storms and um, uh, other natural disasters. So, but I, I do support it. It's just going too fast in my opinion. Thank you. And then finally, Mr. Weaver, 20 years from now, what do you think will be your most important contribution to the city as a commissioner? Well, um, I like the fact that there are willing participants to put their homes on the historic register. Um, my neighbors told me that um, I should put my house on the historic register, and I asked why, and they said, because a future commissioner lives there. <laughs> but um, all joking aside, um, we can uh, maintain our lakes and the ambiance of our canopy and all these wonderful things. Uh, Rollins is doing some very nice reinvesting in their um, campus right now. They've maintained that beautiful open space and green space and the views of the lakes. They're taking um, students that were um, somewhat of a nuisance off the streets and uh, putting them on property. Uh, I know the homeowners in college quarter like that. I think that enhances the student experience and I support those kinds of things. But um, I would also like to see Progress Point um, become a, a, a major green space. It's the only thing we have left near downtown that can become green space. And I'd like to see some um, real stormwater activity um, and management come out of that property. Thank you. Yeah, let me share my long-term vision as a long-term resident who brought his kids up here. Um, part of what I've talked about with the trees and the undergrounding is just part of it. Uh, the rest of it deals with, with a vibrant, uh, low-density environment that my grandchildren have the opportunity to grow up in, in the best place in Central Florida, if not all of Florida, to raise a family. Um, the way to get there we're on the right track. We constrain population growth. We allow uh, all the madness around us to, to be, uh, uh, you know, whatever it wants to be because we don't control it. But we can control and manage the growth internally to Winter Park. We have no need for development outright at all. We have need to encourage development that fits what we want as a community, not what the developers want. I think we all share that same point of view. Uh, uh, the long-term view of Winter Park is that it's going to be the most socially and financially valuable place to live in Central Florida, and I enjoy the opportunity to continue to work towards that goal. Sweet. You already asked me that. Yeah. I did. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Did you want me to rebut? <laughs> As usual, I'm lost. Okay. Um, I have to say that this is the end of the questions that we have for today. Um, now, each of you will have two minutes to close, starting with Mr. Weaver. Thank you. Um, normally, I would have um, some nice things to say, but sadly, when innocent people get caught in the crossfire of heated campaign wreck, rhetoric, it can hurt. This recently happened to a very dear friend of mine, Jennifer Anderson. Jennifer sent a private email invitation to someone, the one person whom she thought was a friend. The in invitation to a party for me outlined Jennifer's reasons for supporting my campaign and not supporting Mr. Weldon's. Somehow Jen's email reached Fran Weldon who drew some incorrect conclusions. From there, things escalated and the email thread became a paid political advertisement from the Weldon campaign under the guise of an urgent email from the mayor. It's time to get things straight. Mrs. Anderson is not my campaign manager. I'm managing my own campaign. Mrs. Anderson did not recruit me to run for office. Actually, Mr. Weldon's record as a commissioner did that. The email was sent to one person and only one person, not to many, as alleged by the mayor. 
Mrs. Anderson's attempt to correct Mrs. Weldon's misinformation and to apologize to both Mr. and Mrs. Weldon were rebuffed. Thanks for hearing me out. Now let's get back to the issues that are facing our city. Thank you. Okay. Um, the real important issues here are the policies of the city of Winter Park and how they're directed by the city commission. I just ask you to concentrate on my 12 years of experience with the city. I've uh, been appointed to three different boards under three different mayors, which is highly unusual. And I've been elected to the city commission and uh, I have a wealth of experience and, and known commitment to this city. I've made some material changes in this city or I've helped drive them. And I have some slides here that I'd be happy to review with you later uh, that show some of the fantastic progress we've made in the city of Winter Park. The city of Winter Park is in the best condition it's ever been in 140 years. Uh, I am always a person who digs into the details, who, under, who strives to understand the founding facts that determine what a sensible decision is and to assess the risks and return of those decisions before I vote. Uh, I'm endorsed by five former mayors, Mayor, Mayor Leary, Commissioner Sarah Sprinkle, uh, and uh, over 130 women leaders and moms who want me to be continuing as your city commissioner. I thank you for your time today and I ask for your vote. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. I want to thank each candidate for participating in this forum. Mayflower residents, don't forget that the supervisor of elections will be here on Tuesday, February 26th in the Standish 